In recent times, we have seen a spike in innovation within the finance space. Technology is creating new opportunities to deliver financial services in unique ways and lots of startups are leveraging on this. We now have innovative ways to make payments, access credit, budget our personal finances and many other services thanks to the rise of fintechs. However, not all fintech solutions have been effective and safe for consumers and the market at large. There have been lots of fintech products that have ended up fronting for underlying scams or having business models that end up ripping off the public and causing systemic risks. These have been seen particularly in crypto solutions and in the spaces of digital credit. Now that's where the regulator comes in. Now traditionally, the regulator had always been a step behind the innovative space of financial services. Now this meant that fintechs largely went unregulated because there weren't any specific regulations drawn out for them. Therefore, most of their products were experimented with the general public and anyone with a tech-enabled finance solution could call themselves a fintech. However, in recent times, we've seen a lot of proactivity from regulators with lots of policies that focus on fintechs specifically. Regulators such as the Ghana Central Bank have gone the extra mile to set up fintech and innovation departments to license and regulate fintechs and have announced the creation of fintech sandboxes, which are intended to provide a testing ground for fintech solutions in a controlled environment. But what exactly are regulatory fintech sandboxes? Why are they necessary and how do they actually work in practice? Are they really a good thing for fintechs or not? These are the questions we chat about in this video. Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. My name is Jeremy and if you're new here and haven't yet subscribed, please consider doing so because on this channel I speak about digital transformation, agile strategy and personal development. Fintech is the future of finance. Now that is a statement that is increasingly gaining traction as more and more people are beginning to buy into it. It seems regulators have bought in as well. Now, on the 25th of February 2021, this year, the Central Bank of Ghana released a press statement to share the launch of a regulatory and innovation sandbox pilot in collaboration with a firm called Mtech Service. They stated in the press release that this was in line with their commitment to evolve and enabling an inclusive regulatory environment that promotes fintechs and supports innovation. Now, since the launch of the very first regulatory sandbox in the UK back in 2015, the concept has gained traction on a global scale. Some of the more notable ones are the Reg Lab in the UAE and the FCA Regulatory Sandbox located in the United Kingdom. So let's jump in by first defining and explaining what a regulatory fintech sandbox is to begin with. So very simply, a regulatory fintech sandbox is a new regulatory approach that allows innovative businesses like fintechs a space to experiment and test out new products, services and business models under the oversight of the regulator before bringing them out to the market. For example, if you had an innovative idea or prototype of a solution to the extremely high mortgage prices and repayment amounts where via your solution, which probably leverages certain algorithms or a unique business model where more people would be deemed eligible to own houses and could afford them at cheaper rates, then a regulatory sandbox would be the ideal testing ground to ensure that the solution operates as intended and doesn't solve one problem by creating newer problems and also allows the regulator to gain first-hand understanding of the solution so they can guide you towards ensuring your system minimizes risk and is sustainable in the long term. Now, I hope that makes sense. It's essentially the regulator's attempt to create a safe space for fintech ideas and innovations so there's better alignment between the sector and they, the regulators, for mutual benefit. Now, why are they even necessary? That is actually a good question that really needs to be considered in depth before launching a sandbox. Now, as mentioned, earlier in 2015, there was only one known regulatory sandbox which belonged to the UK, and two years later, there were 17 globally and now, in 2021, there are over 70 plus countries who have either launched or announced their intentions to launch a regulatory sandbox. It's possible that some regulators who launch these sandboxes are under the influence of their peers and do this so they are seen to be in tune with the trends and not falling behind in the innovation space. However, without careful consideration of your local environment and the specific needs of fintechs and consumers, 
you might rather be adding an additional layer of complexity or presenting another hoop that fintechs have to jump through if this isn't effectively executed. Regulators would definitely not want to alienate any innovators in the process. The main goal for the fintech sandbox is to integrate compliance and regulation with the rapid growth we're seeing from fintech companies without suffocating them with rules and restrictions while still ensuring that customers are protected. Now, apart from that, there are several other advantages, but before we jump into those, let's look at how it actually works in practice. So the regulatory sandbox usually follows a test and learn approach. So the regulator would specify the criteria for eligibility for fintechs who will be granted access or admitted to participate in the sandbox. The scope would need to be defined appropriately in order to ensure that resources are not wasted on aspects that can be handled outside of the regulator's sandbox, such as a more privately owned incubators or accelerators that are designed specifically for that purpose. The regulatory sandbox would have time and scope restrictions and focus mainly on newer niche innovations that don't necessarily fall within the existing lines of regulation where there is also uncertainty as to how they should be treated so that via the sandbox the regulator can determine the appropriate treatment or status to assign to these fintechs. Now this will usually be carried out in a confined environment under the supervision of the regulator to ensure that the tests are conducted safely. Now once they are proven safe and the appropriate legal and regulatory requirements are determined, then it can be scaled up in a live marketplace. Now it's important to know what a sandbox is not as well. Being granted access to a fintech sandbox is not a permanent license to operate or a free pass to test your services on consumers. You will need to be formally licensed in that regard. It's also not a testing ground to determine the business viability of your idea or initiative. As I've said before, that's what incubators and accelerators are for. And lastly, it's not an avenue to leverage the legitimacy of the regulator to attract customers to your product. Now, most regulators will specify the exact criteria under which your fintech product or service will be prioritized. And in Ghana, for example, it clearly outlines that preference will be given to products and services leveraging blockchain technology, remittance products, reg tech, EKYC, and services or products that are targeting financial inclusion. Now this makes a lot of sense for a sandbox because these are typically new business models not covered under the existing regulation or their nascent innovations that haven't been fully explored but have a strong potential to scale and solve some of the teething issues of inclusivity within the financial services space. Building on that, now there are some benefits and risks associated with fintech reg sandboxes. Let's start with the benefits. Now, there are many benefits that a sandbox hold, not just for the fintechs, but for the regulator and customers as well. For the regulator, it serves as a base of evidence for policy making. Sandboxes allow regulators to observe fintechs in close proximity to gain a better understanding of their technologies and business models. Now, this enables them to draft better regulation to cover areas that were previously unclear or simply non-existent due to the unfamiliarity. It also signals the openness and commitment or willingness of the regulator to promote and understand fintech innovation. Now for the fintechs, it grants them access to the regulator that they may have struggled to attain. It almost becomes a form of mentorship in the sense that fintechs in the sandbox obtain regulatory guidance in real time in some cases, they also gain waivers to enable them experiment. There is supportive infrastructure and in certain unique instances, such as when initiatives are in line with the regulator's own strategic goals in areas such as reg tech or financial inclusion, they may even provide some funding because they want to see your product through. And this is a significant benefit that standboxes hold for fintechs because when you have the backing of the regulator, that instantly legitimizes your business. Now to the customer, it provides them protection against dysfunctional novel initiatives that could lead to potentially harmful products and services. Now in recent times we have had well-intentioned fintech products and services that ended up causing problems such as leaking customer data, technological glitches that resulted in financial losses, and poorly structured business models that ended up mimicking Ponzi schemes that also put customers at great financial risk. Now under the supervision of a regulator these risks are greatly mitigated to the benefit of the end user and the customer. Now with that said, there are certain risks associated with regulatory sandboxes as well. 
Now most often, like I mentioned earlier, regulatory sandboxes are undertaken by central banks to signal their alignment with the innovative times. This most often means that it's not thoroughly thought through and there is limited capacity to run the sandbox. The kind of dedication, resources, tools and attention that are required are not granted and this essentially limits the effectiveness of the sandbox and defeats the purpose. Additionally, when clear rules and eligibility criteria for selection isn't put out in the transparent way or the criteria that needs to be met for a fintech to tick all the boxes and exit the sandbox are not clear, it can cause certain issues with competition where fintechs may not feel they are competing on a level playing field and that leads to perceived favoritism on the part of the regulator. It's of utmost importance that the regulatory sandbox be comprehensively planned and executed in order to meet the objectives for which it was intended. So friends, I hope that provides some clarity on what fintech regulatory sandboxes are why they are necessary and how they work in practice. Now, regulatory sandboxes have only been in operation for the last five or so years and the results and lessons learned are still being observed. If properly designed, planned and executed, they can be powerful tools to advance innovation within the fintech space. However, they must be tailored to each country's specific local context in order to be effective. I hope you found this video valuable. If you did, remember to hit the like button and drop me a comment and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers guys.